The greatest strength of the German panzer divisions during World War II was their rapid speed and ability to engage the enemy with concentrated force. But sometimes this was not enough, and additional firepower was needed to soften designated targets. This was the job of the panzer division's own towed artillery. However, this was not always possible, as the mechanized towed and horse-drawn artillery could not always keep up with the advancing panzers. They also needed time to properly set up for firing and were prone to enemy return artillery fire. A more suitable solution was a tank-based self-propelled artillery vehicle. This was not possible to achieve in the early stages of the war, as the German tank industry was barely keeping up with the demand for tanks. It was not until 1942 that the first proper steps were undertaken in developing such vehicles. While initially dedicated vehicle designs were considered, due to the lack of time, the Germans went for a stopgap solution. Originating from this requirement, two different designs would emerge. The larger 15cm armed Hummel, or Bumblebee, and the smaller 10.5cm armed Vespa, or Wasp. While intended as interim solutions, both would be built in relatively great numbers and used up until the end of the war. Welcome to a new Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. I'm your host Mark, and if you like our work, please consider subscribing on Patreon or donating on PayPal. All of the funds gathered there are used to pay for the amazing illustrations you see on our website and in our videos. Every amount, no matter how small, can be a big help. During the early stages of World War II, German army officials were aware that having mobile self-propelled artillery that could keep up and support the panzer divisions was desirable, but no major effort was made in that direction. There were a number of reasons why this desire was never implemented during the first few years of the war, or before it. One fact was that German industry was unable to produce enough tanks, let alone have spare production capacity for other projects. Anyway, the Luftwaffe provided the panzer divisions with adequate close operational fire support to compensate for the lack of mobile artillery vehicles. Between 1940 and 1942, there were a number of different but limited attempts to build such vehicles. These included the Panzer I and Panzer II based self-propelled vehicles equipped with the 15cm SIG-33 infantry gun, which were built in small numbers. French captured tanks and tracked artillery tractors were also modified for this role. By 1942, it was obvious that the development of self-propelled artillery was urgent, as the Luftwaffe was beginning to lose control of the skies. For this reason, in the same year, Waffenprüfung 6, the office of the German Army's Ordnance Department responsible for designing tanks and other armoured vehicles, issued new requests for self-propelled artillery vehicles. The initial request may have been somewhat overcomplicated, as it was requested that the new vehicle should have a full 360 degrees firing arc. The second major request was that it should be possible to remove the main weapon and use it in a static emplacement. The Germans had a few such projects in development, like the ones based on the Panzer IV chassis, the Hausschrecker, or grasshopper, for example. However, these would take too much valuable time to be properly developed and adopted for production, so the German High Command, the Oberkommando des Heeres, OKH, decided to proceed with a simpler solution for the time being. The so-called Zwischenlösung, interim solution, was to include chassis and other components that were already in production and available. After a short deliberation, in mid-July 1942, a decision was made by the Panzer Commission to reuse the Panzer II-F chassis for this purpose. The Panzer II tank was already obsolete, and used mostly in the reconnaissance role. Its chassis was also being reused for the Marda II anti-tank project. To design this new vehicle, a contract was awarded to Rheinmantal Borsig and Alket. The Panzer II-F chassis had to be modified by moving the engine to the centre of the vehicle, thus making room for a rear fighting compartment. It was to be lightly protected and armed with a 10.5cm howitzer. 
When the vehicle was completed and tested, a report was presented to Hitler, in which it was noted that this modification was feasible to enter production by the end of July 1942. The first official name given to this vehicle was the Leichter Feldhaubitzer 18-2 SF Auf Geschützwagen 2, dated from July 1943. During its service life, the vehicle received several slightly different designations. These included GW2 Vesper für LEFH 18-2 SF Auf Geschützwagen 2 from August 1943, Geschützwagen 2 in November 1943, Leichter Panzerhaubitzer auf SDKFZ 123 in May 1944, and Leichter Fieldhaubitzer 18-2 auf Fahrgestell Panzerkampfwagen 2 SF SDKFZ 124. The name by which this vehicle is best known, Vespa or Wasp, was actually only a suggestive name that was officially discontinued after February 1944. For the production of the Vespa, FAMO, Fahrzeug und Motorenwerker, GMBH, located in Breslau, and Ursus from Warsaw, were chosen. FAMO was already involved in Panzer II and Marder II production, so it possessed the production capabilities necessary for the new project. According to the German Army production plans for this project, some 1,000 vehicles were to be built by May 1944. After that, a better designed mobile artillery piece was to replace it, something which never happened. The first two production vehicles would be built by FAMO in February 1943. In order to speed up the production of the Vespa, the Marder II production would be terminated. The FAMO main production line at Breslau would be included in Vespa production up to August 1943, after which it was to focus solely on the production of the large SDKFZ-9 half-tracks. Following this decision, it was also decided to reduce the overall production order to 835 vehicles. With FAMO leaving the Vespa project, the only manufacturer remaining was Ursus. From February 1943 to June 1944, some 676 Vespas would be built. The Vespa was constructed using a heavily modified Panzer II chassis. Its hull consisted of the forward-mounted transmission, centrally positioned engine, and the rear fighting compartment for the crew and the main gun. The Vespa hull was slightly longer than the original Panzer II hull, by some 220 millimetres. The suspension of the Vespa was, in essence, the same as that of the original Panzer II, with some changes implemented during production. With the addition of the new gun, more crew members, ammunition and so on, it led to an increase in weight from 9.5 to 11 tonnes. To cope with this extra weight, the Vespa suspension was additionally strengthened by widening the leaf springs above the wheels. The first Vespas produced had the same bump stops as the original Panzer II. After only a few months of production, new stronger bump stops with vertical volute springs were added on the first two road wheels on both sides. The vehicles produced after November 1943 had one more bump stop added to the last wheel. The Vespa's engine was positioned in the centre of the Panzer II F hull. This was done to provide more working space for the crew and provide better stability during the firing of the gun. The power plant was unchanged, using the same Maybach HL62 TR six-cylinder water-cooled engine, giving 140 horsepower at 2,600 RPM. The maximum speed with this engine was 40 kilometers an hour, and the cross-country speed was 20 kilometers an hour. A new superstructure was placed on top of the modified Panzer II hull. The front part of it consisted of a simple armoured plate placed at a steep angle. On the left side, a fully enclosed driver's compartment was added. The original prototype had a more rounded driver's compartment cover, 
the actual production vehicles had a simpler, three-sided design with angled armour. To have some access to the transmission, a round hatch was placed on the right side of the front superstructure plate. The remainder of the superstructure covered the centrally positioned engine and served as a base for the rear crew compartment. On both sides, there were two cooling air grills for the engines. To the rear of the vehicle, a new open-topped fighting compartment was placed. It consisted of several armour plates bolted together. The height of the side armour plates lowered to the back, mostly to reduce weight. To the rear, a rectangular-shaped door was placed. It could be easily lowered to provide more working room and easy access to additional spare ammunition from auxiliary vehicles. Inside the crew compartment, on both sides, there were a number of brackets for various equipment, such as the radio, fire extinguisher, canvas cover, MP submachine guns and their ammunition, and so on. Shells were stored to the rear, and the propellant on the sides, inside the fighting compartment. The Vespa was only lightly protected, but this was intentionally done in order to reduce the overall weight and speed up the production as much as possible. The armour thickness was also limited in order to not adversely affect the vehicle's overall driving performance, as this was the main point of the new vehicle. The front armour of the hull was 30mm, the sides and rear were 14.5mm. The front superstructure armour was 15 or 20mm thick. The sides and rear of the superstructure were 15mm and the top 10mm thick. The main fighting compartment was protected by all-round armour only 10mm thick. For the main weapon of the Vespa, the proven 10.5cm LEFH-18-2 field howitzer was chosen. This was the most common field artillery piece that the Germans employed during the war. It was designed by Rheinmetall and put into service in 1930. The 10.5cm LEFH-18-2 had good overall performance, but the range was somewhat lacking. For this reason, it was improved during the war in order to increase its range, mobility and ease of production. The main weapon had an elevation of minus 5 degrees to plus 42 degrees and a traverse of 20 degrees in both directions. The maximum firing range of 10,650 metres could be achieved using the 14.8 kilo heavy high explosive round. To help with the recoil, the 10.5 cm LEFH 182 was provided with a muzzle brake. During long marches, the Vespa's main gun could be locked in place by two travel locks. One was placed in front of the gun's shield and one to the rear. The 10.5 cm howitzer's two-part ammunition consisted of the shell and the charge. There were three different types of shells that could be used. These included the standard high explosive, armour piercing and smoke rounds. Initially, the ammunition load consisted of 32 rounds and charges. This was officially changed to 30 rounds on the 28th of June 1943. Of these, 18 high explosive rounds had normal fuses and 4 had double fuses. The remaining 8 rounds were armour piercing. Regarding the charges, 45 were carried inside the vehicle. For close protection, the crew had at their disposal a 7.92mm MG34 or MG42 and two 9mm MP38 submachine guns. But given that these vehicles were supposed to act as artillery fire support from longer ranges, these would ideally be rarely used. The Vespa had a crew of five, which included the commander, gunner, loader, radio operator and driver. The driver was positioned in the front hull and was the only crew member that had all-round protection. The remaining crew were positioned in the fighting compartment. The gunner was located to the left of the main gun with the radio operator behind him. To the right of the gun were placed the commander and the loader. Due to the Vespa's small size and cramped fighting compartment, the crews were left with no room to carry extra equipment and spare parts. There was not even room for their personal belongings. It was quite common to see external modifications, such as added storage boxes, spare tracks, although there were standard holders for spare track links on the front lower hull, 
road wheels, and all sorts of other equipment that the crew may have needed. The Vespers were mainly issued to the Panzer or Panzer Grenadier divisions of the German army, but also some quantities to the SS Panzer divisions. Six artillery vehicles plus two ammunition Vespers were used to form a battery, which was allocated to the artillery regiment of the Panzer divisions. On average, each Panzer division would have 12 Vespers, while in rarer cases, some had 18 vehicles. These would be further reinforced by a battery of six 15cm Hummel self-propelled guns. For the upcoming German Kursk offensive, six divisions were to be equipped with Vespers by the end of May 1943. These included the 17th Panzer Division with 12 vehicles, the 3rd and 29th Panzer Grenadier Divisions, each with 18, Panzer Grenadier Division Grosse Deutschland with 12, SS Das Reich with 12, and the Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler, also with 12 Vespers. The following month, nine more divisions were equipped with Vespers. By the end of 1943, over 30 armoured divisions would be equipped with Vespers, with the majority having 12, and in rare cases, 6 or 18 vehicles. The Vesper first saw combat action during the German offensive at Kursk in 1943. As the German progress was slow, the Vespers were mostly employed as static artillery support. But thanks to their mobility, they could easily avoid any return artillery fire and minimise their losses. While not intended to engage tanks, other than in an emergency, the Vespers could repel such an attack under ideal circumstances. Such a thing happened some 50 kilometres northwest of Orel, when a group of eight Soviet tanks tried to overrun a Vesper battery. The Vesper crews opened fire at ranges of over 1.5 kilometres, targeting the Soviet tanks with a mix of armour-piercing and high-explosive rounds. Due to the rapid artillery fire, the Soviet tanks decided to abort their attack and retreated without loss. Not many problems were noted by the crew of the Vespers, with one of the few being the wear on the teeth in the steering gear. There were also problems with oil leaks in the drive housing unit. By the end of 1943, very few Vespers were lost in combat. Of the over 30 divisions which employed them, only a few had less than 10 operational vehicles, with most being at full strength or close to it. In Italy, the Vespa performed somewhat more poorly, but this was mainly due to the terrain. In a report made by an unnamed German officer who was sent to Italy to examine the Vespa's performance on this front, he noted that the terrain was the Vespa's greatest enemy. The planned employment of the self-propelled artillery within a panzer division practically never occurred in Italy. This was due to the peculiarity of the terrain and the combat situation. In actual fact, the self-propelled artillery were preponderantly employed in platoons, or only as individual guns. Therefore, in no way were useful experiences obtained on the tactical employment of the self-propelled artillery. He also noted several problems with the Vespa that were a consequence of the difficult terrain. These included engines that were too weak and unable to effectively overcome the steep terrain. The final drive units often broke, and there were a number of other breakdowns of other parts like brakes, brake linings, and so on. He also mentioned that the 3rd Panzer Grenadier Division had 11 vehicles operational out of 18, while the 26th Panzer Division had only two operational out of 12. The Vesper would also participate in the Battle for France in 1944. In March 1945, there were still some 307 operational Vespers. Geschützwagen 2, Vier Munition. The lack of a tracked ammunition supply vehicle was something the Germans never managed to solve completely. In the case of the Vespa and the larger Hummel, they came up with a simple solution. The gun opening on the fighting compartment was simply covered with a sheet of metal. This modified vehicle was able to carry some 90 rounds of ammunition. Between June 1943 and June 1944, some 159 vehicles would be built. Today, there are a few surviving Vespers in the world. 
there is one Vespa in the Munster Panzer Museum in Germany. This particular vehicle is actually the first prototype. Another one is at the Russian Patriot Park Museum, and one more is at the Samur Musée de Blonde in France. There are also a number of Vespa wrecks, like the one at the Battle of Normandy Museum in France. In Germany, there is one at the Westwall Museum at Permassens. Two more are in André Becker's private collection in Belgium. Despite being designed as a temporary solution until properly designed self-propelled artillery vehicles could be introduced, the Vespa proved to be a successful vehicle. It provided the German armoured units with a fire support vehicle that was able to keep pace with them. While less than 700 were produced, these were widely distributed through various armoured divisions. They were not perfect and had a number of issues, mostly related to their original intended design as a temporary solution and the use of an old, lightweight chassis. As the Vespa was meant to be quickly pushed into production, some things like the working room and armour had to be sacrificed. And that concludes this video. You can find other articles and more information regarding German vehicles on our website. Ratings, comments and subscriptions would be greatly appreciated. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and Reddit. We also have a link to our Discord community server in the description below. If you would like to help us continue and refine our work, also consider donating on our Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to help us enhance and design new articles and features for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.